Elaine. Hello. So, Jenny. Hello everyone, we're gonna wait just a couple of seconds more as folks are coming in, um, but I have muted everyone for the call so that uh, we can all hear each other. All right, it's 12.02, so I'm gonna get started. And we are on Facebook Live too. So we can be waving it at those watching on Facebook. Good afternoon all, my name is Jenny Tassi and I recently came on as a director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. Thank you so much for being here today on Zoom or Facebook Live, wherever you're coming. Uh, regardless, if you're watching this a day later, welcome. We have muted, like I said, all participants meeting today since there are a fair amount of us on the call and I even see that's growing right now, which is so exciting. Throughout the event, please put any questions you have in the chat. If you're tuning in via Zoom, uh, you can also put in comments or questions in the comment piece uh, on Facebook Live. We'll take questions from both those places after our keynote speaker, Megan Black, uh, speaks just a little later on in our presentation. The meeting agenda will be dropped into the Zoom chat momentarily, which is what I'll be doing. You'll be seeing that coming from me and you'll see where we're following along on the meeting for today. Now I'd like to turn it over to our annual meeting co-chairs, Dr. Moffick. Thank you, Jenny. And we'll hear more from you and about you as time goes on. I just wanna talk a couple of minutes about time and how it relates to our theme today, which is powerfully unifying, uniting. Um, and to do so, I want to start, unfortunately, with myself um, and show how that can show up in different aspects. First of all, personally, the most important thing for me has been powerfully uniting with my wife uh, and muse of over 50 years rusty. Here at JCRC, I represent JNF, who has been powerfully uniting with Israel for over 100 years. And recently with other psychiatrists, I helped edit a book on Islamophobia and another one on anti-Semitism. And then last week also did a video interview about racism, which included some about anti-Semitism. But it's the larger time that I wanna spend a couple minutes about. And that's the time that is historical, psychological and societal. Um, because I think in a way, the time we're now is a time that tests our, man, our souls. And you've probably heard a variation of that statement by Thomas Paine. It was from, it was from Revolutionary War times. And in 1776, the army of Washington was faltering and freezing and used the words of Thomas Paine to rally the troops and won independence. But of course, independence in the terms of freedom wasn't for everybody. It wasn't for African-Americans and we're still struggling with the legacy of racism 400 years later, both within ourselves and across ourselves. 
And we not only have racism to contend with, but also anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other stereotypes. So I hope, I'm looking forward to our main speaker to talk about this some more and give us some inspiring ideas, just like Thomas Paine did. What George Washington also knew is the importance of transitioning leadership. And we've been expert at that at the JCRC. We've had great leaders, but we've also been able to transition well and we'll hear all about our transitions later also. So we have a lot of things to look at as far as um, powerfully uniting. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rabbi Borowski, who will give us a Devar Torah. Rabbi. Thank you, Dr. Mafek. So first of all, if we were all in the same room together today, we would be breaking bread together at this time. So if you've been waiting for a ceremonial start to our physically distanced luncheon, please feel free to join me in Hamotzi. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, eternal our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And now, a few words of Torah as you enjoy your lunch or not. Always timely. This week, we read Parshat Korach, a story of protest and rebellion, power and community. Korach and his followers stand up in front of Moses and Aaron, and they ask, in essence, why are you so holy? Aren't all Israelites holy? The Torah tells us that Korach says to, Mo to Moses and Aaron, quote, you have gone too far for all the community are holy, all of them, and the eternal is in their midst. Why then do you raise yourselves above the eternal's congregation? The response from Aaron and Moses can guide us as we strive to unite with others to use our power to lift up and support our greater community and to take our first steps toward action, even if we're not entirely sure what they should be. From the beginning, Moses and Aaron listen closely to Korach and his followers. Moses and Aaron stand up for their community, giving the opportunity for all of them to appear together in judgment before God. As elsewhere in the Torah, God wants to wipe us out. Moses and Aaron pray for God's mercy instead. Moses and Aaron lead the community to reunite before God, even with those who aren't quite sure that they are ready. Moses and Aaron use their power to lift up others. Yes, Korach's rebellion is ultimately quashed by God and God's miracles. But before that, Moses and Aaron take it seriously and they treat its leaders with nothing but respect. After God's punishment, the rebellion becomes a lasting memorial. The fire pans of those killed by God are attached to the altar as sacred objects, as a reminder to stay united as a community. After the instigators of the rebellion have been killed, and Moses and Aaron have prayed for God's mercy on the rest of the people. The Israelites are, understandably, upset and scared. Once again, God wants to destroy them. Once again, Moses and Aaron are distraught. And instead of pleading with God this time, they turn to action. Moses orders Aaron to quickly make expiation for the people and as they literally go among the people, the plague ends. I cannot imagine that Moses planned that action in advance. And I suspect that that night in his tent, he thought of several things he could have done differently or done better. But in the moment, Moses knew enough to jump in and get started. He knew his actions might not be perfect. And he probably knew that they wouldn't be enough but he knew he had to do something. And so it is with us today. Through the JCRC, 
through our synagogues, our community relationships, our organizations, we work together. We work together as Jews, as Milwaukeeans, as people who care about our world. We lift up those who are not only fallen, but who are silenced, even when it means using our own platforms to amplify the voices of those around us. When our community is hurting, our Jewish community, our Milwaukee community, our American community, or any part of our community, we give our support in any way we can, and we do so as soon as we can. Moses showed us that we don't need to wait for the perfect action, the ideal circumstances, the best way forward, but rather that it is far more important to take the first step and get started. So like Moses and Aaron before us, may we find the power united together to increase the justice and the holiness throughout our community. And we turn now to our JCRC chair, to Ann Jacobs. Thank you, Rabbi Borowski, for that important and stirring Devar Torah. It, it is so timely. And as I conclude my tenure as chair of the JCRC, it, I need to look back on the past few years and, and talk a little bit about the changes we've seen within the JCRC. Uh, we saw a nearly exponential growth in anti-Semitic incidents. We saw historic tropes of anti-Semitism resurrected. And we saw this relentless sort of drum of drumbeat of slurs, attacks, and most concerning is over the past few years, we have seen those increasingly uh, through the eyes of our children. We saw Nazi salutes at a high school. And then most frighteningly, we saw um, in Pittsburgh, we saw the slaughter of our, our fellow Jewish community members. And in that moment, we also saw what the work we did meant to our local community. Because when we felt that horrible pain of that attack, and we asked our larger community to join us, they came and they joined us and they mourned with us. And it is that feeling of connectedness, that feeling of community that is so important in the work the JCRC does. But it isn't only about us. Um, when, our, when the members of our greater community, when they were attacked, when they had horrible things happen, we joined with them. So when our Muslim brothers and sisters mourned the attack in New Zealand, we stood with them. When members of our Latino community were heartbroken over the attack in San Antonio, we stood with them. And over the past three years, there have been too many other vigils and, and, and rallies and events, but they all speak to the struggle that we have here to be a part of our greater American community. And in the face of this, the JCRC here in Milwaukee has strengthened the work it does. We have seen Hours Against Hate grow from a small program into an outstanding response to events of anti-Semitism, racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, you name it. We are present to help people who want to have their institutions do better. We have gone beyond merely reporting on anti-Semitism. Uh, with the help of Dr. Moffick and others, we have put together programs that allow the community to process and address it and deal with security issues as opposed to only living in fear because the risk of living in fear means that we would become inward facing, that we would um, close the doors to our greater community. And instead the JCRC helped for us to become more, not less involved in our, the lives of our 
friends and our family and our greater community. And as a part of that, we have to acknowledge the collective pain, grief, anger that is being expressed across Milwaukee, across Wisconsin, and across the United States over the death of so many black men and women at the hands of police, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, countless others. The JCRC has been present at those marches, at protests, at prayer vigils, in support of our brothers and sisters who are crying for justice. And it is against this backdrop of anguish that we must resolve to do what we can, even if it just feels like a small thing, to improve the world around us. As we are always taught, it is not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to neglect it either. And I am proud that our JCRC has worked not only on so-called Jewish issues like anti-Semitism and Holocaust education, but also on issues of fair policing and racial injustice, because that is our legacy as Jews. I am so proud to have had the honor to lead this organization. I am humbled by the work we have done, and I am absolutely confident our new leaders, uh, Jenny Tassie is our new executive director, and Brian Schupper is our incoming chair, that with them, the work that we need to do will continue full force. I also want to give a very special thank you to our amazing council members and board members. I have gotten to know you and I think that we have one of the most amazing, uh, thoughtful group. And um, I look forward as always, as I plan to remain active to seeing what you contribute to our larger work. I want to thank our co-chairs for today's events, uh, Dr. Moffick and Rabbi Borowski, for the work they have brought to today's uh, events as well. Um, as my necklace says, which many of you have seen before, Tzedek Tzedek Tir Dofi, justice, justice shalt thou pursue. We are commanded to seek justice, and I look forward to seeing the work of our JCRC continue to seek justice for everyone. And with that, we have put together a year in review video for all of you to look back and enjoy.
it has been an incredible year and that's just a small snippet of everything that we have worked on. And now we turn to the uh, work of our annual meeting and Sharon Grinker, who is chair of the nominating committee will be presenting the slate of candidates for election. Sharon. Hello, my name is Sharon Grinker and I'm pleased to serve as chair of the nominating committee along with the rest of the committee, Annalisa Dickman, Lara Amir and Brian Shepper. Each year at the JCRC annual meeting, a nominating committee consisting of the JCRC board and council members nominates new and continuing individuals to serve on the community council and the board. The JCRC council's main purpose is to craft community consensus positions and to be liaisons between the JCRC and either the organization they represent or personal and professional networks. The board, on the other hand, is responsible for the governance, oversight, and strategic direction. Before diving into voting, on your screen, you should see a list of our life members and past chairs. These individuals served on the JCRC board as past chairs, steering the JCRC over many decades and helping serve as the voice of the Milwaukee Jewish community. We would like to recognize these individuals for their dedication to JCRC, the Jewish community, and the entire Milwaukee community. Now I'm going to hand it over to the JCRC chair, Ann Jacobs, to call a vote on the nominating committee's recommendations for JCRC community, community council and board. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I appreciate very much stepping up to be the chair of the nominating committee uh, and for your hard work in that regard. So first, we are going to be voting on the recommended slate of community council members as set forth by the nominating committee. And Allison will be bringing up that list. These are the uh, persons that we are recommending remain on our large uh, community council. You can see we are adding four new members or recommending four new members, Matthew Friedman, Marvin Tick, Aaron Littman, and Ben Wagner. Um, and you'll see also the three re-nominated members, Nina Florsheim, Steve Isaacson, and Doug Levy. And also below are the continuing members, those who are enjoying the work and who have agreed to continue their service. Um, you are going to be seeing, um, first of all, we're gonna be asking for a motion uh, in the, for the, um, to move these members into approval. And if you could make that motion, please. Anyone who wishes to make that motion can use the chat function to do so. Jay Beter has moved that into uh, that slate. Is there a second through the chat function for those folks? There is a second from Annalise Dickman. Thank you. We are now going to be voting on this slate of moved candidates. I'm going to ask the JCRC council and board members only to fill out the poll that is about to be popping up on your screen. If you're just, uh, we know that um, it's a little confusing, but everybody's going to be seeing the poll. And if you're just a little confused because you're not a council member, that is one of your choices as well. So you would click yes or no and submit your vote. And we're gonna briefly allow everyone to do that. So go ahead and click on the poll. And Allison is going to be collating those results. And a majority has voted yes to approve that slate of candidates. Thank you. Now, um, we are gonna be voting now on the recommended slate of the JCRC board members. The board is the body that uh, is the leadership body of the JCRC and the nominating committee has 
made the following recommendations of board members. You will see um, two-year terms being recommended for Jane Avner and Danielle Shelton. And for the officers, uh, Brian Shupper is nominated to serve as chair, which would make me the immediate past chair. Annalise Dickman is nominated to vice chair and Craig Johnson is also nominated to vice chair. And you will see on the lower right-hand corner, the re-nominated members and at the lower left, the continuing members. I'm going to be turning to the chat function uh, seeking a motion to uh, move the slate of board members. Is there a motion to move the slate of board members? It is moved by Doug Levy. Is there a second? Laura Amir seconds, thank you. You will now again see a poll for approval. If you wish to vote for that Slate, you will vote yes. You, um, if you disapprove of the slate, you will vote no. And if you're not a council member, feel free to click that or simply close the poll. And I will wait briefly for all of you to make your votes. And then Allison will be tallying them. So go ahead and make your vote. Thank you. Much quicker this time. Everyone's got the hang of it. Uh, that slate of board members has been approved. So I wanna again, thank our amazing continuing board and council members and welcome our new uh, members. And now I am turning it over to our new chair, Brian Shooker, who is our newly elected chair of the JCRC. All right, well, thank you, Anne. Um, and a couple more thank yous coming up shortly. So um, it is often said, may we live in interesting times. Uh, somehow 2020 got the message a bit mixed up and has tried to give us those interesting times all at once apparently. Um, five long months ago, just about nobody had heard of COVID. Two short months ago, not enough people had heard about Black Lives Matter. We have quarantine fatigue, yet we don't know if we're at the beginning, middle, or if the end is in sight. I can't wait to get back to the office and, and I especially can't wait for the kids to go back to school. Um, through all of this, the one thing though that I miss the most is community. Being with others, like-minded or not, developing and enjoying relationships, human contact. One of the toughest things about holding this meeting virtually is the lack of immediate audience feedback. I mentioned to my wife how difficult it was gonna be to gauge if my jokes are bad or simply underappreciated. She suggested I avoid them altogether. While I'll try to do that, I can't help but feel sad that we're not together today in person, as this is when we should be giving a warm welcome to Jenny and celebrating Alana in recognition of her years of service, guidance, and leadership that has made Milwaukee a better place. There's only so much affection that can be conveyed virtually, but I hope both of you feel the strength of the communal bear hug being sent your way. I'm especially sad we're not together because we can't properly thank my friend Ann Jacobs, who stewarded the JCRC for the past three years with a firm hand, an eye always on the health of the Jewish community, and a passion for translating those values for the betterment of all Milwaukeeans and all Wisconsinites. And I intend to emulate much of your leadership style, particularly your ability to synthesize multiple points of view while never losing sight of your own core values. And I look forward to when the community can convene in a more traditional fashion so we can properly thank you. Thank you as well to the nominating committee the annual meeting chairs and all our new and returning board and council members and everyone joining us today at this annual meeting. Each of you is a critical partner in the good work that we do. As we were planning the annual meeting, we agreed not to verbally list our special guests. You know, the time when we say the names of some elected officials and other community leaders, and they don't know if they should stand up and everyone isn't sure if they should applaud each other. I'm not sure that would be more or less awkward in the virtual meeting format, but we're not going to find out. However, there is one special guest I do want to acknowledge because she emulates everything I hope to be as a leader and I hope will guide our JCRC. And that's my friend, Stephanie Finley, who I'm guessing many of us at today's annual meeting do not know. She may not admit it, but Stephanie has been a role model for so many young African-American women and men in Milwaukee, particularly at a time when it wasn't fashionable. Stephanie is a black female entrepreneur 
who created her own business in the construction industry. That's tough. She's tough enough to follow her dreams and do the right thing, even if the cards seem stacked against her. That's admirable, but it's not the only reason I admire her. When she would be justified in ending her long days when she clocks out of the office, Stephanie is just getting started. As in starting a foundation to help others in the local African-American community that need a boost. As in serving as chair of the Social Development Commission, where we served on the board together for six years, working to end the scourge of poverty for all Milwaukeeans. As in chair of the City of Milwaukee Election Commission, preserving voting rights and fair elections for all of us and chair the African-American Chamber of Commerce. The list goes on. But one thing Stephanie is not is Jewish. Yet when I shared the invitation to the JCRC annual meeting with a number of friends, Stephanie was the first to RSVP in literally three minutes. See, the reason I admire Stephanie and hope my leadership of JCRC emulates her comes down to three things. She cares passionately about the community from which she's been grounded in. She cares passionately about the larger community finding ways to balance supporting the universal and the local, even when they're seemingly at odds with one another. And she's a friend who demonstrates friendship by deed and not just word. In my mind, these are the traits the JCRC requires to be successful in our mission to speak as the representative voice of the Jewish community on issues of public affairs and policy. We care passionately about the Jewish community from Milwaukee to Moldova to Jerusalem. We care passionately about the larger Milwaukee community and must balance these two passions. Finally, we must be friends to each other inside the Jewish community and to our friends outside the Jewish community. The heart of Jewish community relations is developing friendships before we need them and before they need us. When, for example, Israel comes under fire, it's powerful to see the Jewish community unite by the thousands in solidarity. But in my opinion, it's infinitely more powerful when others are out there marching alongside us on the issues that matter to us and us with them. In the last decade living here in Milwaukee, I don't recall seeing a more powerful image than the Bema at Congregation Beth Israel Ner Tamid on October 29th, 2018, the evening of our community gathering to mourn the anti-Semitic carnage at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. At one point, clergy from all faiths present joined together on the Bema in a show of solidarity. Sikh, Hindu, Muslim, Catholic, Lutheran, so many others. In one of our most acute times of need, our friends were there with us in word and deed. So here we find ourselves in an historical time where our friends, our neighbors, and our community members under the banner of Black Lives Matter are facing their acute time of need. I've been awestruck at the desire throughout the Jewish community, individuals, and institutions to get involved to show support, to do something. Yet, and I'll be the first to admit this, most of us are unsure of what to do. Perhaps we've acknowledged our too frequent absence in bettering the lives of our neighbors. Many of us have put up yard signs and attended and still attend protests and rallies. Maybe we even made a donation or became a member of organizations like the Urban League or the NAACP. It's only a start. First, and I'm glad to say that many of us as individuals and as institutions have already done this. We need to emulate those faith leaders who put everything aside to demonstrate support for us during our time of need. We need to emulate my friend Stephanie, who by simply showing up said, I'm a friend and I'm here to support you. To be clear, we need to let our friends, individuals and institutions, formally and informally know that we stand with them. Then we need to stand back. We need to listen. We need to recognize where and when to act and to ask how we can best support that when we don't recognize how to act. And then we need to follow through, not just today when Black Lives Matter dominates the news cycle, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day until we help create the change we wanna see. This might be a news story today, but it's not a news story to the JCRC or the Jewish community. For the past years, we spent considerable time crafting meaningful alliances and friendships with friends in the black community. And for that matter, with friends in just about every community in Milwaukee. In doing so, we reflect a collective identity that swings between two poles. As Jews, even Jews in America, we know our history and worry that once again, we can become the other, the victim, the target. We can never escape being in the minority. Yet we're also a community 
that has achieved immense success economically, socially, academically. Most, but not all of us, identify as white and we navigate comfortably among the majority. As we grapple with what it means to be Jewish in America in 2020, it's okay to acknowledge that we are part of both the majority and the minority. It gives us extraordinary perspective and also calls upon us to strengthen our Jewish community while also strengthening the community at large. We can't have one without the other. Of course, this is 2020. So before making predictions about where our priorities will lay, let's acknowledge we're not even halfway through the year. We still got an election, possible major activity on the ground in Israel, a potential second wave pandemic and the continuing battle for racial equality and social justice. And I saw on the news today, we can now add the new phrase Saharan dust storm to our lexicon. These are just the things we know about oh, 2020. So briefly, I envision our collective energy to focus on the following, supporting our friends in BLM, particularly with our pre-existing work on community policing, as well as education and mental and physical health, voting access and fair elections for all, support for Israel, and vigilance in the battle against anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred. Finally, to claim to be the voice of the Jewish community, we must be certain we're hearing from across the Jewish community. The JCRC has a great model, a council that's split nearly evenly between institutional representatives and at-large members. But we still have work to do to make sure all voices have regular access. We must always maintain two-way channels of communication across institutions and individuals. I'm privileged to step in as chair of Milwaukee's Jewish Community Relations Council at this moment. And I look forward to working with each of you, formally and informally, in big ways and small, as we strengthen and stabilize our community and our communities. Now, glad to turn it over to our new JCRC director, Jenny Tassi. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you so much for sharing your words and your vision. I'm beyond excited to be working with you and all the important work we have ahead uh, within the Jewish community, within the Milwaukee community. It's going to be hopefully an amazing year, um, hopefully amazingness and, and not more surprises ahead and the good fight that we get to do. In a moment, we'll have an opportunity to hear from Megan Black. She's a national clergy organizer for Faith in Action, a multi-faith, multi-racial network of faith-based community organizations committed to ending racial inequity and economic injustice in our communities. Over the last 10 years, Megan has organized to abolish predatory lending, reform, immigration policy, and, and mass incarceration. That's an incredible feat just in itself. She currently works with clergy and movement leaders exploring the intersections of race, religion, and organizing with an emphasis on the relationship between white supremacy, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Black racism. As a reminder to what we said I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions throughout Megan's comments, please leave them in the chat or in the Facebook comments. We'll compile those at the end and leave time for discussion. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our keynote speaker, Megan Black. Hi, everyone. It is really, really good to be here. Um, Brian, actually, I think you just gave my whole um, presentation, so we can maybe cut out a little bit early. Thank you for your words. It's been really lovely to um, hear the affirmation of um, an understanding of community that is Milwaukee-wide, nationwide, et cetera, for the JCRC. It's um, really, really wonderful. I'm really grateful to Alana Khan and Jenna and the rest of the JCRC team for making it possible for me to be here today. When we first started talking about this particular convening several months ago, the pandemic was a very distant reality and people still boarded airplanes. And I thought I'd be able to shake your hands today. And instead, here we are. And I have to confess, I find myself short on answers, solutions, conclusions, um, and really overwhelmingly consumed by lots of really messy thoughts and ideas and questions and emotions. This is a remarkable time in our history, as every speaker today has, has noted. Um, and I find that a little, frankly, um, a little overwhelming. I'm sit, when I sit by myself on the sofa and try to make sense of it, I realize I don't know that I have the resources to, to fully understand this moment. So what I'm excited about today is to share some of those messy thoughts and ideas with you. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll get through these remarks quickly enough that we'll also have time to discuss them. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about myself uh, and my work, just to provide some context. Um, I do want to speak directly to this moment. 
Um, and it sounds like fairly in tandem with what you all are already talking about, which I find really, really exciting. Um, and then uh, I am looking forward to that discussion. So as I'm speaking, please feel free to drop your thoughts and questions and reflections in the chat box, as Jenna mentioned, and she and the JCRC team will flag them for me when the time is right. Although I also um, encourage folks to unmute themselves and, and speak up when we have the time for discussion. Um, thanks, Jenna, for providing a, a few background details on um, my work. I just want to share a little bit more so you all know where I'm coming from. Um, I am a Midwesterner as well, by upbringing and now by choice. I grew up in Iowa. I went to a Catholic school, a university in Indiana, in northern Indiana. I lived in Chicago for a couple of years. I still have a sister there. She's in the Bronzeville neighborhood. Um, and I've bounced back and forth between Kansas City and Nashville since 2011. I know technically Nashville is the South, but it has a lot of Midwestern vibes. So I'm going to claim it for both. Um, but since 2018, I have been permanently back in Kansas City, um, which is where I am now. I love it here. I'm on the Missouri side, but I can walk to Kansas in about 10 minutes. So I love kind of straddling these two states. Um, it has um, really become home. And so I'm really thrilled to be talking to fellow Midwesterners. It's, I work for a national organization, so I travel a lot and I spend a lot of time on the East Coast and being in the Midwest and talking to folks who live in the Midwest is a really refreshing change of pace because people in Boston are not very friendly. <laughs> Um, so I've been working in and around the faith-based community organizing world since 2011, um, mostly via Faith in Action, which is where I am now. Um, we're a national network, much like the National JCRC, with chapters across the country. And each chapter works with local congregations to lead on some of the prevailing moral issues in our communities, um, which has included immigration reform, mass incarceration, access to health care, employment, and wage equity, gun violence, you know, et cetera. Um, it's worth noting as well, as Jenna said, that in the last five years, we've been really intentional about, intentional about adopting a racial justice lens through which we engage these issues. When I came on with Faith in Action, I had just finished a Master of Divinity degree in Nashville. It was 2016, and so I came on in the midst of an election year to work with clergy, and those clergy were mostly Christian at the time. But since late 2017, my work has, has pivoted pretty dramatically. In October of that year, we had a national convening of clergy in Indianapolis. And though Faith in Action is a historically Christian organization, we've styled ourselves as interfaith for quite a while now. And the convening we planned for Indianapolis was really intended to highlight, among other things, just how good we were at being interfaith. <laughs> but what actually ended up happening was a group of rabbis organized themselves and ran an intervention on our little delusions of um, interfaith um, miracleness. So this group of rabbis approached the leadership team to share their experiences inside of our organization and our broader, broader network of being tokenized and othered, and then their concerns about how little we as an organization that was committed to justice and equity and a society that values everyone, how little we were doing to address anti-Semitism and a dominant Christian worldview within our ranks, ranks and in the world. Uh, we were already seeing a rise in anti-Semitic language and sentiment following the 2016 election. Um, and some high profile events like the Women's March had revealed how little anti-Semitism is understood in this moment and especially its relationship to racism. So our, teams, our leadership team's response to the rabbi's intervention was to assign me to go handle this whatever that meant. And so I ended up partnering with a rabbi colleague in Massachusetts, Rabbi Margie Klein Honkin, who has since become a dear friend, to try to figure out where our gaps were on anti-Semitism and Christian hegemony and how to bring the rest of our network up to speed. It did not take long for us to realize that our organization wasn't struggling with just how to be an interfaith community. In reality, we had deep institutional blind spots around anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and Christian dominance. And we were being hampered in our multi-faith, multi-racial aspirational work by unresolved tensions fed by anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism. Mostly we found people just didn't know how to talk to each other about these things or what to do with the strong emotions that experiences of anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism bring up, which might feel familiar to us in this moment. So back then in late 2017, early 2018, at Rabbi Margie's suggestion, we decided to pull together, which feels so long ago, by the way, it's like so far, but also so close, crazy. 
So at Rabbi Margie's suggestion, we decided to pull together a multiracial convening of rabbis, um, Christian pastors, and community organizers to directly confront and hopefully heal some of these tensions. And as I am a Black non-Jewish person, and Rabbi Mar Margie is a white Jewish person, we also worked on putting together a pretty diverse training team of rabbis and organizers, and we paid an advisory council made up of Black Jews, Arab Jews, Jews of color from across the country to provide feedback and counsel along the way, as Jews of color sit right in the intersection of these realities and therefore have unique and remarkably clear insights into these matters. So that convening took place in April 2018 in the Beit Midrash at Leo Beck Temple in Los Angeles and included a pretty even mix of rabbis who are mostly white and pastors who are mostly black. And it was an extraordinary two-day event, um, one which the rabbi of the temple, Rabbi Ken Chasen, later told me was one of the most important events he thought that space had ever hosted. And I, I'm telling you about this now because I've been thinking about it a lot over the, the last couple of weeks, and um, especially in preparation for today, knowing that I'm speaking to a Jewish organization and a predominantly white Jewish organization. And so I wanted to bring it up because there was a dynamic that emerged in that midrash that I think has a lot to suggest for this moment. And I'd like to unpack it with you. Um, but before I do that, I'll just note uh, for the record, we did not solve racism or anti-Semitism in that room, which bummer. Um, but that event did completely change the trajectory of my work. And so since that spring in 2018, I've worked really closely with a team of rabbis, pastors and Jewish and non-Jewish organizers to develop a shared, uh, we call it an anti-oppression training framework, one which takes the realities of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and Christian dominance into our accounting of white supremacy and racial injustice. And in that work, I partner with local and national Jewish organizations from across the country on these trainings um, and on Get Out the Vote efforts, which I'm really excited to know that y'all are, are doing. Um, and then I also work with Eric Ward and the Western States Center to examine and better understand the role of white nationalism in this discourse. And I'm grateful to Eric and Western States for being part of how I got in front of y'all today. So before I dive into um, some of the kind of takeaways from the space in 2018 and how I'm thinking about them in this moment, um, I wanna name that this space was, uh, it was an incredibly powerful experience because it was so hard because people really put in work and were very vulnerable and um, it said very painful things and to each other and in the interest of trying to better see each other. And I'm reminded of, I remember in that space, my body was just like completely tightened up and my heart rate was just racing and I felt completely physically exhausted and depleted at the end of it. And I find that that has held true every time I, I get into a space where we're trying to navigate these different forms of power and oppression. And so I, of late, I've been reading, um, I just started, I'm not super far into it, but I'm excited about it. I've been reading My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem which is a book about um, uh, racialized trauma and how it lives in our bodies. And he opens the book by uh, asking everyone who's reading it to pay attention to how our bodies react to, um, to the, the things he discusses in this book. So not just engage it with our minds, but also be aware of what's happening in your body as you're, as you're working through these pieces. And so I wanna invite um, that same practice into this, this space today. Um, as, as we get into how we unpack that space, I know that my body is probably going to tense up. I'm already feeling all of the jitters that come with speaking in front of a group of 100 people plus however many on Facebook Live. And um, so I'm paying attention to that. And, and so I invite you all as well to pay attention to if your shoulders, you know, hunch up or if your breath shortens or if your heart rate goes up or if you feel tension, um, just, just hold on to that. It's, it's, it's an important message. So... I say all of that to bring it back to that space in 2018 and to what I've been chewing on of late, which um, is, is really around whiteness. It's been truly remarkable to me to see so many of the white folks in my life describing this moment as a waking up, using language of like, you know, coming to awareness, my eyes are being opened, this kind of like coming out of this uh, like sleep into, into this whole new reality. My own mother, who's white, I, I come from a biracial family, my white mother, who has shared the last 35 years of her life with a 
six foot six, heavy set, bald, dark skinned black man in Iowa and has seen things um, that I don't think she ever expected to see growing up in a small town in Nebraska, told me the other day that she is um, w- seeing things about her husband, about my father, about the way he moves and lives in the world that she has never seen before, that had been hidden from her or been too painful for her to look at. I mean, that's true for how she's even thinking about, she's realizing things about my life and the life of my sisters. And so I find this language really telling. Um, It makes me think around what I believe is one of the great deceptions of whiteness, which is that it convinces us that some kind of safety and security and comfort is available to us. Um, But the cost is that we have to live our lives in a kind of drug-induced dream state. And it's really apparent that the, this kind of cocktail, this like white supremacy cocktail of drugs is starting to wake to wear off and people are waking up and, um, and they're waking up painfully. Like it, you're waking up and you're realizing that the world is darker and uglier than perhaps we gave it credit for. Um, and that it's, it's been hidden um, or maybe not hidden, but just like really unbearable to look at. And I, I have such deep empathy for this experience And I have to imagine, knowing that I'm speaking to a group mostly of white folk, white Jews, that some of you are going through this as well, this kind of recognition that um, that there is something that 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 there's an extent of things that you haven't fully understood before. The world is a little uglier than perhaps we've been willing to acknowledge up until this point. And I also have to imagine that um, this experience of waking up is a little bit different in the Jewish community and particularly for white Jews. And this is, this is what I wanna kind of talk about today. Um, it's not lost on me that the people who stole African people from their lands and made them black and slaves were European Christians. And these are the same people who also invented the hatred of Jews as a race and laid the seeds for modern anti-Semitism. And these European and then, uh, and then American Christians created whiteness on the backs of black folk and Jews and indigenous people, and in doing so committed some of the greatest atrocities in human history, the transatlantic slave trade, the Holocaust, and the genocide of millions of Native Americans in the westward expansion, just to start. So the Jewish community I know has never been able to fall asleep to the dangers posed by white Christian supremacy. But in my mind, it's also no accident that Ashkenazi and white passing Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews have been able to assimilate into whiteness, which has meant making a fairly recent escape from some of the racialized systems that isolate and detain and impoverish and disempower and ultimately kill black people and black bodies. Um, These are like the dangers of policing and healthcare and housing and criminal justice and education systems. All of these things contribute to black death. It also means that white Jews are allowed to live comparatively free. I know not totally, but um, from some of the daily fears and traumas and aggressions and isolation that being black or non-white in this country provokes. But I also get the impression that being allowed to become white has not been a totally convincing olive branch because most of the white Jews that I know tell me that they regularly wonder which of their Gentile friends, which includes me, would hide them when that genocidal moment comes around again. And it's true, although sometimes a little overused, overblown, that white Jews have historically been among the most reliable white allies to the black civil rights movement. So there's obviously some affinity between these two experiences. And so I'm, I'm just like genuinely curious about what it means for white Jews to be both white and Jewish in this moment. And I'm curious because I actually think I think that there's something important for all of us in, nav- in, in like digging into this question. And this, this brings me back to that training that I was talking about, that convening in Los Angeles at Leo Beck. So the original impetus behind that convening was to bring Jewish and Christian clergy together to talk about anti-Semitism and racism. But we realized that it would be a room full of mostly white rabbis and mostly black Christians And that means that a conversation that was supposed to be about two kinds of powerlessness, the powerlessness that uh, is experienced in racism and the powerlessness that is experienced in anti-Semitism, had to also include a discussion about the two kinds of power that these folks brought into the room by virtue of their identities. For the Jewish folks, it meant we had to talk about whiteness. And for the black folks, it meant we had to talk about Christianity. So we had that discussion. 
uh, it was clumsy because we had been so focused on talking about the ways in which folks are oppressed that we had fallen out of kind of the practice of learning how to talk about the ways in which we wield power in the world. And so it, it was a clumsy conversation, but I, I found, I just like, it was fascinating as well because it turned out that whiteness for the folks in that room, that whiteness as a means of power and safety and security for these Ashkenazi Jews was a very real part of their lives. And it was also largely unexamined. And what was ex interesting about the experience of black folk with Christianity was the extent to which black folk have sought to transform Christianity from a dominating and colonizing religion to a means of freedom and liberation. Now we can argue about how successful this effort has been. Certainly it has not been without its um, pitfalls and some of those have been very painful, but it does make me wonder if the key, or, or maybe let me not put all the burden, or one of the keys to transforming whiteness into an experience of cooperation and equality and wholeness doesn't lie perhaps within the American Jewish community. So I see some evidence of this already. The organizations I work with have an institutional level commitment to solidarity, to deep learning and sharing, to confession, and are increasingly equipped to hold their allies lovingly accountable to the ways in which we perpetuate anti-Semitism. And it sounds like the JCRC is one of those. And I've also seen many of my rabbis using their Jewish imagination to help imagine and shape and speak into existence a world in which the kind of freedom and liberation and security that Jews both remember and anticipate exists for all. And I heard some of the folks who spoke earlier say something very similar. Um, I have to shout out uh, as part of this kind of work of reimagining and transforming whiteness alongside finding racial justice, making racial justice, I have to shout out the amazing work being done by Jews of color across the country, many of whom have become my teachers in this moment and absolutely my best thought partners. Uh, the work being done by, by black Jews and by Jews of color to translate the Jewish tradition to this moment, to this world, to all people is, is like honestly astounding. It blows my mind. It is in, in the 10 something years I've been organizing, it is some of the best organized and presented work I've ever seen. And this past week, I attended a Juneteenth um, Seder on Zoom with like 60 Jews of color from across the country and friends and allies. And it was so powerful. I had not realized how much I needed it. And every song that we sang together healed a part of my soul. Earlier this week, actually, I spoke with Shahani McKinney um, Baldwin, who's there. In, well, she's actually in Madison, but she's from Milwaukee. Um, and heads up Adult Midwest, which is the Midwest Regional Jewish Diversity Collaborative, I'm sure many of you know about this, which focuses on affirming and supporting Jewish ethnic and racial diversity across the Midwest. Um, and so she and I was talking to her about um, speaking to y'all today and some of what I was thinking about. And I'm really excited to share that um, the JCRC and I have together decided to donate half of my speaker's fee today to Adult to support Shahana and Kai Mishlove, who is the adult um, staffer there in Milwaukee. Um, and so I think we're gonna post a, a link to their work. Um, I'd encourage other folks to, um, to reach out, donate if possible, um, to really support the work of Jews of color in the Midwest. One of the things Shahana told me in our conversation was that her mother used to run the American Jewish Commu Committee in Milwaukee and would host freedom staters for the black and Jewish communities in Milwaukee to tell the stories of black and Jewish freedom through the ritual of the Seder. And that these spaces became places where black folks and Jews and black Jews always knew they had a home together. And I love that story. It's a little bit of what I imagine for us in the future that is to come, a place in which the stories of who we have been shape the stories of who we will be um, together. So these have all been musings. Um, I'm, I'm exploring them. I don't have concrete, you know, I haven't landed on, you know, any of this is the truth. But the one thing that I do know is that the first step toward this kind of vision, this kind of world um, is obviously and always solidarity. And I heard so many of you expressing that earlier today. And it's so, it like slows my heart rate down, my elevated heart rate, it like slows it down in a good way to hear y'all say that. Um, but solidarity is harder than it sounds um, because it requires not just affirming the experiences of black and brown folks. It also means examining the role of whiteness in our lives. 
It means waking up and finding the strength to stay awake and present and um, relying on our traditions and particularly our Jewish tradition in this case to imagine a world in which people are safe and alive because they are Jewish and or black and not in spite of it. And the JCRC as a site of institutional knowledge, learning, advocacy and community building all across the country and in Milwaukee is so well positioned to lead in this. So I'll close now by saying that it has been strange for me as a person who grew up Christian and has multiple degrees in Christian theology to realize that I find myself turning to the Jewish tradition more and more to find spiritual grounding and direction in this moment. And if I can go back to that Beit Midrash at Leo Beck Temple one more time, I remember um, singing a nigun for the first time. I had no idea what it was um, until that until that space. We sang it for the first time. I sang it for the first time. Um, and in the midst of an incredibly painful and very charged um, and also productive, but charged couple of days, that first nigun was an experience for me of pure freedom and strength and hope. And I thought about that, that experience um, as I was preparing for today. And it's part of why I was so excited and grateful to be able to be here with you today. And it's what I hope that that feeling of um, freedom and strength and hope, it's what I hope for all of us um, as we navigate this turned upside down world. So I'm paying attention to my body and realizing that I need to pause and take a breath. Um, and so Jenny, I think now would be a good time to um, check in about the discussion. I haven't seen the chat box at all while I've been talking. Thank you so much, Megan, and, and thank you so much for your thoughtful words. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over this last bit of time, and I just am excited for the day that you actually get to come to Milwaukee, hopefully, uh, and fellow Midwesterners, hopefully we'll be able to travel again. So now I want to open up to discussion questions. Again, folks who have questions, please put them in the chat as well. If you're tuning in via Facebook Live, you can put them in the comments, and we are monitoring that as well. Um, any questions you have? or for Megan about her remarks, work, her incredible amount of work that she's done. Um, please, please do that now. Uh, and Lisa has a, a great, great question. I'm um, sorry, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read both of those from Annalisa and, and Ariel, but first let's read Ariel's. She asked, the moment has really zeroed in on the structural and systemic nature of racism. Can you share more about how you see this intersecting with anti-Semitism? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go back to that room and Leo Beck. Um, one of the, so we wanted to spend quite a bit of time talking about um, structural and systemic uh, oppression. And uh, what, so when we were planning it, not having kind of planned this particular kind of space before, we planned it around storytelling. Uh, we were gonna pre present like kind of an initial framework of like, here's how to understand systemic racism and here's how to understand systemic anti-Semitism. And uh, we got into it and we had folks tell stories. And we realized that um, we had kind of set ourselves up um, for folks to take the wrong message away about how anti-Semitism and racism are related because, um, or, or the way, not only related, but also the ways in which they're different. Because the, we got into the conversation about racism and all of these black, um, black people in the room had tons to say about, you know, times that they've been pulled over by the police, housing discrimination, job discrimination, like all of this just like very visceral, it was a very lived um, kind of articulation of systemic um, uh, and structural race, racialized pain in this country. And when we got to anti-Semitism, um, we ended up communicating, I think, a kind of diluted message about it because anti-Semitism doesn't show up structurally currently and the way that racism shows up it it like exists kind of in the ether and like little like droplets of it fall down and remind you that like people are still anti-semitic until all of a sudden a lightning bolt comes down and there's like blood and death and gore and and so we hadn't accounted for here's the consequence of the way in which um, anti-semitism is deployed to keep people um in line and afraid and um, in control and that's different from how racism is experienced, which is this kind of day by day wearing down, like just kind of erosion of, um, of power and control and agency. And so, um, so I, I think, you know, 
we, this is part of the conversation going forward is like, how do we get clear about this is this is why I'm so interested in the idea of racialized trauma and how our bodies hold this because part of I think what gets in the way sometimes of black and Jewish solidarity is that the way in which we experience these traumas um, manifest differently in our communities and and leads to um, lots of misunderstanding. And we end up kind of wielding the worst of like, we end up saying, well, you, this happened because you're white or this happened because you're Christian and you don't understand Judaism or you don't understand anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, and so, so yeah, so, so there's a, a great deal of learning, I think, to do to examine the ways in which um, these forms of oppression exist differently, but come from the same root. That's a really, really gets it a little bit. Yeah, it's a really wonderful way of articulating that. Thank you so much. We are just getting flooded with questions now. Um, I think we're going to take two more uh, from Annalisa. She said, "How can we be more welcoming within Jewish institutions uh, to Jews of color, um, but also African American folks of any faith who speak to engage or who seek to engage rather? What are the barriers you see, um, and what can be done about them?" Yeah. Well, here's what I'll say. I think actually starting with Jews of color is a really, really great way to get into, Jews of color are, have a, a foot squarely in the Jewish community and squarely in their communities of color. And um, when I tell you they are ready, <laughs> they are ready for this conversation with the broader Jewish community. Um, in fact, they should be the ones here talking to you, not me, because um, they have insane amounts of resources and, and wisdom and knowledge to share. And so, I think um, having a really, really good conversation first with um, the Jews of color in your community um, and Edot is a great place to start, but then there's also just like collectives across the country that are doing a lot of shared learning and working through some of these issues. Like that, that is always a place to go, figuring out what do we need to do to center this leadership more in our congregations, more in our institutional organizations, um, so that that wisdom comes alongside um, uh, all of the wisdom that exists in the kind of existing Jewish mainstream and Ashkenazi tradition, et cetera. Wonderful. But go to Jews of color, pay them and pay them, pay them for their efforts. It is so exhausting. Throw all the money. I love that. That's really, it's a really good way to emphasize it. Uh, I'm going to read Sean's question real quick and reading this for folks who are tuning in via Facebook Live. Um, what is your approach either one-on-one -on -one or giving a presentation when addressing white privilege and racism and anti-Semitism? Do you believe the times we yeah. are living in uh, are not conducive to having these really tough conversations and important? Yeah. I mean, I think they're extraordinarily conducive to having these really tough conversations. Um, I am a really, really big fan of storytelling. Um, it's why I mentioned my mother. It's why I mentioned um, Leo Beck and that, that training experience that we did there. Um, I think being able, I think one, being really clear about your own story is a really good place to start. And, um, and being really clear about here's what I'm not sure about. And so um, one of the things that uh, one of the kind of cultural outputs of white supremacy is this um, kind of notion that we have to have answers and we, we can't be caught flat-footed. We can't be caught uncertain about something. And, um, and the way to combat that is to just go in up front up, up from jump and say, I am not sure what to make of this, but here's a story from my own life that I'm really wrestling with, or here's an experience I had, or here's a conversation I had or something I saw that has me wrestling with this and can we, you know, can we, can we unpack it together? Um, I think also, you know, I come from a, a mixed race family and so I spend a lot of time navigating two very different. I have, um, I have relatives on both sides of my family who are worlds apart. And I spend a lot of time kind of navigating between those two spaces. And I have a, a kind of finite amount of patience, <laughs> even so. And so part of it has also been realizing um, what are my boundaries as far as like, what's the conversation I can have that is still loving and still open and still helps me see you. And what's the boundary I need to have in place so that I can, um, that makes it possible for me to step away and recharge myself before I become resentful or angry. 
Um, there's, there's just so much uh, uh, in developing out emotional uh, maturity and ma emotional wisdom that, um, that makes these conversations more possible. Thank you so much for that. And if it's okay, also would highly recommend this Resma Menachem book, um, My Grandmother's Hands. So good, so, so good. Someone asked that in the Facebook chat. So that's wonderful. So the name of that book yeah. is also saved there. And if it's okay with you, Megan, we have one more question that I'm gonna um, bring to you. That's all right. Okay. Um, uh, Rabbi Adams of the Wisconsin Council of Rabbis asked um, the strong bond that exists between the Jewish and African-American communities in the past has weakened in recent decades. Why do you think that has happened and what can we do to mm -hmm. strengthen, strengthen those ties again? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, you know, part of what happened, uh, it was actually really hard to get, when we were planning this, this training in 2018, it was hard to convince people to come into the room. Like everyone wanted to see solidarity and relationship, but no one wanted to, everyone was um, very, afraid is the wrong word, uh, wary, leery about doing the work because of how draining it would be and because they didn't feel safe. Um, and I think part of that, like when I look back and see what's different from the civil rights movement to today, I'm not enough of a, of a historian to be able to like, you know, lay out all the facts, but um, I, what I do understand and what I, what I hear inside of the black community that I belong to, um, and that I think there is some evidence for is part of what happened was that the um, material plight, like the material situation of Jews and the material situation of black folk went in totally different directions, right? And so for the most part, Jews were allowed to, white Jews were allowed to integrate into mainstream American society and, um, and kind of like hit all of the things that made it possible for, for folks to feel somewhat comfortable and somewhat safe and have access to education and healthcare and all these things. And that has just not been the case um, for, for black folk. Like there's, we see it right now. I don't think I need to make the case for that. And so part of it, I think, is that our situations diverge. And um, that's, that's a great thing for Jews. It's not, it's not a bad thing that the Jewish community is, is safer and um, more comfortable. But um, this is where I think also the examination of whiteness becomes really important because part of that assimilation and part of that um, achievement came with it, this kind of um, like ad having to adopt a cu the culture of whiteness. And that immediately creates, I think, a gap from like, it just creates a chasm um, between the black community and, and the Jewish community, the white Jewish community. And so, um, there's work to be done on anti-Semitism inside of the black community. That's very, very obvious. Um, and um, especially, when, I mean, like the non-Jewish black community. And um, I think that the work that has to be done on whiteness is just like also so critical. I would suggest slightly a little more critical because whiteness I think is maybe a, a little more of a threat, <laughs> um, but I, I think that's part of it. And I think, so then the other part of the question was, how do we bridge it? Um, I mean, I really am impressed by what you guys have laid out in terms of um, what the JCRC, like the, uh, the agenda, the platform for the rest of the year. I think that's really, really great. I think finding ways to show up and stay, stand behind and um, wield the kind of privileges of whiteness on behalf of folks of color is a really, really important way to do that. And I think it's about giving it a lot of time and a lot of affirmations of solidarity. The biggest fear, I will say, this is true for me, it's true for every single person I talk to, every black person I speak to right now. The biggest fear I have is that um, the election is gonna come around and um, depending on the outcome, white folks are going to get comfortable again and it's not going to matter. And we're gonna be kind of back where we started. And so um, really working that muscle of resilience and longevity is going to matter so, so much. Did we end right on time? Yeah, you got it. Definitely. That was like, thank you so much Amazing. for for speaking and, and your, your words um, and, and just being a keynote speaker. And, you know, like I said, I really hope you're able to come back, um, visit us in Milwaukee one day. Uh, that your words are really, really important. We appreciate your thoughtful remarks and, and the discussion we were able to just have. So thank you everyone who engaged in that discussion. Uh, and also, Megan, for pushing us to ensure that we think deeply about our own stories is really critical in this time and also thinking deeply how we as individuals show up in this moment.
So I'm going to give a, a brief director's remark and closing remarks to, to wrap up today. Uh, and with front, I just want to thank everyone for coming. And I also want to thank Megan for your generous suggestion, as I think you noted during your remarks, that half of your honorarium will be going to a DOTA Midwest. I was blown away and excited when you made this suggestion. Uh, the JCRC is very fortunate to be in partnership with ADOT, and I look forward to continue working with Kai Gardner Mishlov, who unfortunately couldn't make it on here today, but we do have Shahana McKinney Baldwin on the call today, the ADOT director in Madison. So before I dive in, I also want to make sure we highlight our constituent representatives on the community council. Um, Andrea, do you think you could pop that web page on in the chat real quick? We don't need to put it on the screen share. But just put uh, that in the chat. We want to highlight the constituent representatives that are nominated through the organizations that sit on the council. Thank you, Andrea, for doing that. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, my name is Jenny. And for the past two months, I've served as the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. To briefly introduce myself to those of you I have not met yet, I grew up in Shorewood and graduated from the Milwaukee Jewish Day School and E.W. Madison. My professional and volunteer work have been centered on social justice, civic engagement, and community building. Starting this role has felt like a total homecoming that gave me a strong foundation in the community that I've been able to come back to. I want to take the time we have left today to reflect on JCRC's work over the past year and briefly discuss where we're going. In her tenure, Alana Khan ensured that the JCRC emulated the shared Jewish philosophy of Tikkun Olam, meaning repairing the world. This past year, the JCRC remained committed to building bridges, which may be best illustrated by November's bipartisan trip to Israel comprised of Wisconsin Assembly leadership and staff. I was fortunate enough to sit on the, the council of the JCRC when Alana reported on the trip. And she painted this beautiful picture where the elected officials, well, the first part isn't great, the elected officials were divided on the bus. They were divided based on party lines, staff and, and officials. But by the end, the two sides were nearly indistinguishable. So the JCRC won't be able to spark these kinds of relationships every day, but it's in the coalitions and organizational relationships like the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee, the 80% Coalition, the Muslim Jewish Partnership, the Black Jewish Alliance, and so many more that we grow closer together. Making progress during good times and supporting each other during the bad is exactly what we do and will continue to do. In March, many of you may have seen that we released a 2019 anti-Semitism audit and in comparison to recent years, the number rose dramatically from 55% in 2018 and 329% in 2015. This trend is mirrored uh, by reports from the Anti-Defamation League. And we might see another jump and are likely to see with the increasing amount of anti-Semitic rhetoric regarding conspiracy theories and the pandemic. But we combat anti-Semitism with programs like Ours Against Hate and with state legislation like the Holocaust Education Bill. As a community, we will call it out when we hear it. We strive to know people who are different from ourselves and we build community and alliances and we stand up when others face injustices. Everyone in the Milwaukee community wants the same thing, to feel safe without concealing for fear of the prejudices folks around them may hold. We want our black community to feel safe driving, walking, or even sleeping in their own bed without the fear for their lives. We want members of our Jewish community, no matter the color of their skin, to be able to wear kippot anywhere without having anti-Semitic slurs thrown at them. And a line from her care about that Anne mentioned earlier that she referenced in her remarks that has been so resonating with me during this time of uncertainty, which is also a really critical time for change, is you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. This is the work of JCRC that we have done and will continue to do, and I hope you'll be able to join us. So someone who has echoed the sentiment through his work is Robert Freebird. For those of you who attended the annual meetings in the past, you know that it, this award was a, a pillar honoring Mr. Freebird. The Social Justice Award was given out to several folks over the years. Mr. Freebird was an ardent fighter for justice in our city and the award that has been created in his honor celebrates those in Milwaukee who are carrying on his legacy. We wanted to give this year's award recipient the recognition and careful consideration they deserve. So we have decided to postpone the selection, as you know, so it's not part of the program today. And we'll be selecting an individual later this summer and forming an entire panel or discussion around their work. So please consider the individuals in the community that you know who've been at the forefront of moving the needle of justice forward and nominate them. As a follow-up, you'll be seeing the nomination form and information via email and on our Facebook page. And if I can be ambidextrous, I am going to drop it in the chat right now. So please nominate 
We want to just be flooded with nominations because we know they're amazing people doing the work that deserve this recognition in Mr. Freebird's name. So I have several thank yous before we wrap up today. First, a huge thank you to Miriam Rosenzweig and Moshe Katz. I know Miriam had to hop off the call, but they are with the Milwaukee Jewish Federation and are steadfast supporters of JCRC and our work. And I, we can't be more appreciative of what they do. Big thank you to Allison Hayden, Andrea Bernstein, and Melissa Taylor, the staff who are working to make sure the tech ran smoothly. It might look simple behind the scenes, but they are magicians at their work. So big applause to them. Thank you to the JCRC board and council for their commitment to the mission. I've been able to meet a few of you over the phone. No, probably more. There's 60 of us total and uh, I've been able to talk to a lot of you on the phone. And I so look forward to meeting you in person. Your dedication and wealth of knowledge have just astounded me. And thank you to our meetings co-chairs, Dr. Mothik and Rabbi Jessica Borowski, Michael Blumenfeld, who's also on the call of the Wisconsin Jewish Conference, who's our government affairs office in Madison. I also want to recognize two key JCRC leaders. Thank you, Mickey Pollack, for your service as a JCRC. Um, you're becoming a lifetime member now and a former chair. So thank you so much for all you do. I look forward to getting to meet you soon. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to Ann Jacobs, our immediate past chair. Your commitment to the Deuteronomy passage of justice, justice you shall pursue, comes through in all interactions and all of your pursuits. So just a few hours before this meeting started, I got an email. The, that a former JCRC director, Professor Mordecai Lee, who many of you might know, started an endowment for JCRC. I was blown away and excited by this news and I wanted to thank Professor Lee. I couldn't tell if he was on the call for your continued deep commitment to JCRC's mission, even after your service at the helm has ended. That means the world to us. Your generosity leaves a legacy for those, for this work to continue and to grow and to thrive. And I couldn't be more excited to be able to announce that on this call today. I hope you take my remarks and the remarks from everyone you heard today as an invitation to engage. Engage with JCRC, with other Jewish or faith-based institutions around you, and with the leaders and organizations in our community working tirelessly for justice today in our own home city. JCRC Chair Brian Shepper and myself look forward to working with each of you, coming together as a community and a city to stand up against anti-Semitism, racism, and xenophobia in every single one of its forms. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I look forward to seeing you in maybe the Zoom rooms later on and uh, in person one day as well. Thank you, everyone.